Hello, and welcome to The Black Ponder. I'm Neil Trotter, and today we're going to delve into some philosophy of science, actually. We're going to use the field of geology to talk about the philosophy of where we're going as a species, as a human species, right? And we're going to do it via this book right here, The Sixth Extinction in Unnatural History by Elizabeth Colbert. And that's right, I do use the Kindle, I do use the e-readers, that's something that I do. <laughs> I'm not just a stickler for the traditional style paper books. No, 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 I, I, I read uh, e-readers all the time. So this book, uh, The Sixth Extinction, is written by a scientific journalist and is about uh, a pretty hot issue that's going on in the field of geology right now. Geologists are proposing that a new period, a geological period of time be introduced, an epoch called the Anthropocene. Geological periods of time are like, you know, Jurassic, <laughs> like in the famous movie Jurassic Park, I love that movie, uh, you know, or Tri Triassic or Cretaceous. These are names scientists give specific spans of time that denote geological significance. And currently, many geologists are proposing that we uh, specifically give the time period in which humanity influenced the earth that should be its own geological time period because hu human beings have changed the world geologically in such a significant way that it might as well be its own uh, geological period in a way this is both uh, incredible <laughs> right and horrifying <laughs> right that uh, humanity has done something extremely rare, rare in the history of the earth. Our species has changed this earth in such a significant geological way. Hundreds of thousands of years, changes like these happen extremely rarely. Yet within our small period of time that we've been here on earth, we've introduced these changes that are having huge impacts on the way the earth is geologically. And Elizabeth, a Kohlberg talks about this in a scientific way. Let us begin with some quotes and we'll discuss this. So right here Elizabeth Kohlberg uh, is examining this situation that's going right on right now with the amphibians of the world. A lot of species of amphibians are getting wiped out, are heading toward extinction, and it took scientists a long time to figure out why this is actually the case. A rigorous calculation of the background extinction rate for amphibians has not been performed in part because amphibian fossils are so rare. Almost certainly though the rate is lower than it is for mammals. Probably one amphibian species should go extinct every thousand years or so. That species could be from Africa or from Asia or from Australia. In other words the odds of an individual's witnessing such an event should be effectively zero. Already, Griffith, a, a scientist that she's with, has observed several amphibian extinctions. Pretty much every herpetologist, a herpetologist is a scientist that studies reptiles and amphibians, that's their specialty, working out in the field has watched several. Even I, in the time I spent researching this book, encountered one species that has since gone extinct, and three or four others, like the Panamanian, golden frog that are now extinct in the wild. So the indication here is that the rate of extinction of species is unusually high, way above the average. It turns out the reason why amph amphibian species are going through near extinction, a lot of them, is because of some fungal disease that's spreading throughout the world. A lot of amphibious species are infected with this fungus. Some amphibians are able to deal with this fungus disease. They can just live with the fungus living on their skin, but many amphibious species cannot live with it. And that's why they're going extinct. And the fungus has spread because we've migrated to all these different parts of the world and in turn have spread this fungus around. Now let's go back to the notion of the extinction rate getting higher than average. Now back in the day when uh, fundamental theories of geology was first being developed, 
like in Charles Darwin's day. Uh, extinction was a concept that a lot of people, a lot of scientists, could, had a hard time grappling with. It was very difficult to imagine that an entire species could get completely wiped out or just end. Check out this quote. No one had ever seen a new species produced, nor, according to Darwin, should they expect to. Speciation was so drawn out as to be, for all intents and purposes, unobservable. We see nothing of these slow changes in progress, he wrote. It should, to reason, that extinction should have been that much more difficult to witness. And yet, it wasn't. In fact, during the years Darwin spent holed up at Down House, developing his ideas about evolution, the very last individuals of one of Europe's most celebrated species, the Great Auk, disappeared. What's more, the event was painstakingly chronicled by British ornithologists. Ornithologists are scientists who study birds, that's their specialty. Here Darwin's theory was directly contradicted by the facts, with potentially profound implications. The Great Auk was another species that lived during Darwin's day that was driven to extinction by human influence. They were hunted down, basically, to extinction by humans. Now, as Darwin was coming up with his theories, he was just looking at the average, right? And noticing like, oh, okay, well, it doesn't seem like th that type of ch dramatic change, extinction, like a, a species just going extinct in such a small period of time that is highly unlikely, right? Because geological processes, like earth processes, move so slowly, that's probably not the case. However, he was not observing the impact of human influence, right? Humanity was doing things that were outside the average, like extreme hunting. And that tells you right there the significance of human influence that we're, again, is outside the average, the norm, and why it's, you know, geologists are proposing that we call this period of human influence its own separate geological period of time, because it's so outside the norm. Then Elizabeth Colbert goes into detail about the study of mass extinction in general, and how it was very difficult for the scientific community to accept it, because again, it was outside the norm. Uh, she talks about this other highly influential scientist who also lived during Charles Darwin's day who developed a lot of theories that are the foundation of modern day ge geology, Charles Lyell. He, she brings up his study. To Lyell, it was simply impossible or unphilosophical to imagine that this chasm represented what it seemed to sudden and dramatic global change. So in a rather near bit of circular reasoning, he asserted that the final gap was just a gap in the fossil record. The final gap is, she, she's referring to one of the massive extinctions that happened in the, his, the geological history of the earth, such as like when a, a meteorite hit the earth and wiped out the dinosaurs, that mass extinction. Well, the final gap is this other indication in the geological record of the earth which shows that there was some sort of massive extinction, or it highly indicates that. Now, instead of accepting this, instead of taking that idea seriously, like why is there such this huge geological jump from uh, this, this immediate change in geology? Well, Lyell thought, well, we must be missing something. There must be something where you're, we're not catching, because that, that this massive change that just, it just doesn't happen. Philosophically, the earth doesn't work that way. You know, the earth moves slowly. You know, things take hundreds of thousands of years to develop. We don't have such things as massive extinctions. You know, this is back in the day when that wasn't a prominent idea. These ideas were first being developed. And that's very interesting because a lot, we, we do see that all the time, even to this day. We observe things, or science brings up observations, and they contradict our already established norms and ideas about how things should work, right? And it takes a while for people to accept the observations and the science that's indicating to you that, that we do need to think about things differently. 
The fragmentary nature of the record meant that the semblance of abrupt change was just that. With respect to the apparently sudden extermination of whole families or orders, it must be remembered, he wrote, Lyell, that wide intervals of time were probably unaccounted for. Had the evidence of these intervals not been lost, it would have shown much slow extermination. In this way, Darwin continued the Lyellian project of turning the geological evidence on his head. But the more that was learned about the fossil record, the more difficult it was to maintain that an entire age spanning tens of millions of years had somehow or other gone missing. This growing tension led to a series of increasingly tortured explanations. Perhaps there had been some sort of crisis at the close of Cretaceous, but it had to have been a very slow crisis. Maybe the losses at the end of the period did constitute a mass extinction, but the mass extinctions were not to be confused with catastrophes. Right? It's taken a, a long time for people to accept the science, the observation, and it's taken the scientific community a while to accept the science itself. Isn't that interesting? People are developing these convoluted, complex theories that try and pigeonhole the science into the current knowledge paradigm, what's the established, normal, accepted ideas at the time. But at a certain point, the science gets so strong that it would be unscientific not to accept what's being revealed. Then Elizabeth Colbert talks about another scientist that wrote this book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And we will be talking about that for a future video, stay tuned. This is a book that introduces the whole idea of a paradigm shift. That phrase, it comes from this book. This book talks about that issue. When the scientific data has to force a, a shift in the established knowledge base and the problems that happen and the conflicts and the struggles that go into that and why that happens, listen to this. Data that did not fit the commonly accepted assumptions of a discipline would either be discounted or explained away for as long as possible. The more contradictions accumulated, the more convoluted the rationalizations become. In science, as in a playing card experiment, novelty emerges only with difficulty. Kun being the uh, scientist that wrote this book. But then finally someone came along who was willing to call a red spade a red spade. Crisis led to insight, and the old framework gave way to a new one. This is how great scientific discoveries, or to use the term Kun made so popular, paradigm shifts took place. So this notion of the Anthropocene as its own geological age, the point where humanity starts influencing the Earth at a rate that's outside the average, that is another paradigm shift. Like, is it possible for a species to change the, the earth in such a dramatic way? Never have we seen this ever in the history of the earth. Yet it is possible because the science is showing us that it is. It's a paradigm shift. From an earth history perspective, several hundred years or even several thousand is practically no time at all. From a human perspective though, it's an immensity. For the people involved in it, the decline of the megafauna, the megafauna is, is the large mammals that are, are dominant throughout uh, geological history. So she's talking about, Elizabeth Colbert talk, is talking about another extinction that happened. The megafauna would have been so slow to be imperceptible. Alroy, another scientist that she's with, has described the megafauna extinction as a geological, instantaneous ecological catastrophe, catastrophe too gradual to be perceived by the people who unleashed it. So we're talking about hum humans who are driving animals to extinction by hunting them down. In many cases, the hunting is happening at a rate that seems to be very slow in terms of human perception, but is the blink of an eye in terms of how long the earth has existed, right? Two different perspectives, two different knowledge paradigms. The Anthropocene is usually said to have begun with the Industrial Revolution, or perhaps even later, with the explosive growth in population that followed World War II. 
By this account, it's with the introduction of modern technologies, turbines, railroads, chainsaws, that humans became a world-altering force. Elizabeth Colbert talks more about these mass extinctions that happen on Earth. The one feature these disparate events have in common is change, and to be more specific, rate of change. When the world changes faster than species can adapt, many fall out. This is the case whether the agent drops from the sky in a fiery streak, referring to the meteorite that wiped out the dinosaurs, or drives to work in a Honda. Talking about us, right? It's possible for us to cause as much significant change as a meteorite, if you think about it in terms of rate of change. To argue that current extinction event could be averted if people just cared more or were willing to make more sacrifices, doesn't much matter whether people care or don't care. What matters is that people change the world. So the issue here is that humanity's great capacity to change the world also has the potential to create another massive extinction that, we, that the Earth has seen in extremely rare instances. Humanity has the ability to make this happen because of the way we change the world in such rapid ways. That's how mass extinctions happen. It's by changing the world at rates that far exceed the average. There have been five major extinction events since complex animals evolved over 500 million years ago. According to the plaque, so here Elizabeth Colbert is visiting a museum and she's reading this plaque. Global climate change and other causes, probably including collisions between Earth and extraterrestrial objects, were responsible for these events. It goes on to observe, right now we are in the midst of the sixth extinction this time caused solely by humanity's transformation of the ecological landscape. Geology is revealing to us that uh, humanity is changing the world at a rapid rate. And geology also tells us that mass extinctions happen when the world changes at a rate that's faster than species can adapt to it. If an event happens, say like an ice age or a meteorite hitting the earth these kind of events that increase how the how fast the world changes these lead to mass extinctions lots of species dying out humanity's influence on the earth is also increasing the rate that the world changes and this is also leading to many species dying out it tells us that uh, humanity is a very unique and highly unusual species to be able to do this and it's remarkable and is also horrifying right that we have the power to do this that we are in the process of doing this in that way geologists propose that yeah this human influence needs to be its own separate geological period and right now in the, the world of geology that's being proposed it's a paradigm shift it's a shift in the philosophy of science right now. As we move past the whole denial of things such as climate change and the fact that human beings can change, have the power to change the world that affects our very survival in negative ways, we have to continue to use science effectively and allow paradigm shifts to give us more knowledge so we can more effectively do better as a species. Very fascinating book right here. I highly recommend it. Elizabeth Colbert's The Sixth Extinction. Well, you've been listening to The Black Ponder. Tune in next time for more Philosophical Thought.